Hi everyone, I'm extremely excited to be speaking with Abby Hand today. Abby Hand is a preconception health coach and soon to be a published author. She specializes in helping women and couples get healthy before getting pregnant. Uh, Abby supports clients using current research, traditional medicine, and natural philosophies. Additionally, she incorporates positive psychology, biometric tracking, epigenetics, and other valuable tools in, into her complex systems approach to coaching. She also draws on her own autoimmune disease experience and pregnancy experiences to empower folks and help them navigate the quagmire of perinatal and chronic disease care. Abby believes optimizing the health of both parents prior to conception helps build strong families and communities, something I definitely agree with, uh, creating a healthier, more resilient world. So Abby, thanks for, uh, for joining me and I look forward to this discussion. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. I'm very excited. Yeah. Yeah, this, so this is an area that um, is, you know, so something that I haven't really been trained on or, you know, in the medical, medical professionals or physicians don't really get an extensive training on preconception health, right? Unless they're going into a specific specialty of uh, OBGYN or e even then, you know, not to the, uh, ec to the detail of what we're going to talk about today. So it's certainly very interesting to hear about this. Um, Recently, I had a patient, or now, now a little while ago, um, who posed this question to me, essentially that uh, she wanted to get pregnant, and she was basically talking about, uh, you know, what are the best tips and tools and how to ensure that you can be the healthiest you can be before getting pregnant. And, Perfect. you know, for me, my brain automatically goes to just ruling out any sort of major medical conditions or, you know, she actually happened to get diagnosed with Hashimoto's, right, an autoimmune condition. So um, that entered our conversation that way. But in, in general, you know, I did find myself not per se, um, you know, able to give her outside of like, you know, the, the, the real medical um, knowledge, other knowledge around epigenetics and preconception health that we're going to talk about today. So I'm very cu curious and um, excited to learn for myself as well. So awesome. yeah, first I'd love to hear about your background um, and kind of how your journey is, has brought you to where you are today. Yeah, um, it's a long one, so I'll try to be uh, succinct, but um, I am a nurse and I have my master's in master's of science in nursing. My focus was on maternity nursing. And then I worked in labor and delivery for a little while. And that was a, an awesome, very educational experience uh, in a lot of ways, some positive and a lot of them negative. Um, and I came out of my work in labor and delivery with a, a very skewed perception on what I thought perinatal care should look like. Um, and then I had my own pregnancy and I was very much um, enmeshed in the holistic side of things and I caught a, kind of lost sight of the balance. So my pregnancy experience, um, my delivery really recentered me, um, which I think is important not only for myself, but um, for providing clients with a more balanced, more nuanced look at um, what pregnancy would care should look like. Um, and that is, um, you know, it's not only just the, the holistic aspect, but it, it is also the conventional side too. They are both so necessary. Um, that being said, I think that conventional medical education does lack um, some necessary and important information to prepare couples and women in general um, for pregnancy. I think I've heard so many women, and I got this myself, um, when asking, you know, what should I do to optimize my health for pregnancy, for, for trying to conceive? The answer is just kind of maybe consider reducing your alcohol intake and take a prenatal. And that's kind of the Generic, extent of yeah. it. Um, and I just think we can do so much more. We have so much more information, and we have so many more amazing tools that I'd like to talk about today to help people really maximize their health before starting on this crazy journey, right? So, and I don't want to lose some of your listeners right now because they're not thinking about family planning because they're not in that space yet or anymore. Um, because I really do think that, you know, 
optimizing our fertility translates into maximizing our vitality, maximizing our longevity. They are, they go hand in hand. So everything we talk about today isn't just applicable to women and men of reproductive age and desire. Um, it's really applicable to everyone and how to live your best life in your healthiest body. Right. Um, so I kind of got on a, on a tangent there, but, um, my own autoimmune journey led me into functional medicine. And that is where I think I've gotten the most of my education, my more hands-on education, um, surrounding autoimmune disease management, chronic care in general. Um, and then specifically with the epigenetic training that I've had through a peer on, which is here in Austin, um, really learning how to maximize my own health in a much more targeted and streamlined and efficient approach. And that is what I am taking to my clients. Um, I am helping them from a very detailed, personalized and nuanced approach, figure out what their barriers to health are, whether it is something yes. like a chronic disease like Hashimoto's, cause that is just yeah. so impactful in pregnancy. Um, addressing any thyroid issues. Um, but not only the chronic care issues, chronic disease issues, but you know, what, what does your nutrition look like and how can we enhance it in a way that supports all of those things that women, um, bump up against in pregnancy in terms of nutrient deficiencies, um, vitamin D folate, kind of those things that everyone is, mm -hmm. is pretty aware of. Um, doing it in a way that is just so much more bio individualized to their person mm -hmm. based on their genetics. Um, mm -hmm. I get really excited about talking about this stuff because it's just, it's so fun. It's like so interesting to me because I'm a huge nerd. Um, but it's also so impactful. And yeah. I think that I am proof of that. And that is why I am so excited to share that with other people. Yeah. You mentioned a point earlier, I think that's really important to stress on, which was the balance between more conventional care and more alternative care. And so I see this often, and I want to stress this, that, you know, um, the, it ends up becoming a camp. People end up either in the alternative camp and then bashing more conventional care or in the conventional camp and bashing functional or alternative care. And the idea of for us, what we're trying to advocate for is to be in the middle, to take the best from the bo from both worlds. And I think your birth story is, you know, a, a good example of that. And I, I've heard it on a, on a separate podcast that you did. But um, I, you know, my own, you know, my own son's uh, birth story is also similar, or my my kids, where. You know, when we had our older son, we were able to, and on our firstborn, um, we were able to do it in a very kind of alternative manner, if you will, in the sense that we had, you know, he was born in a pool, uh, in, nice. in, in water, um, we had a doula. So we had that kind of, uh, it was obviously a natural birth. Um, we had that ability to have, it, it was still in a hospital, but it was, it felt very unique and personalized and alternative, let's say. Um, yeah. Whereas for our, for our, our twins who are now two, we mm -hmm. needed, um, you know, much more urgent. And there was certainly issues that we needed them to be in a hospital setting where we had conventional experts there. Right. So um, yeah. it, it's a setting in which we have to appreciate both and respect both. And so I think we can both take our kids' experiences and, in your case, your birth experience, um, and take that experience and extrapolate that to all of medical care, where there should be a good balance between more conventional and alternative care. So, yeah, I appreciate you bringing that up. I just wanted to stress on that. Yeah, I think, um, I think there's so much more research available to the general public these days. Um, that really supports a lot of the things that we're doing in the alternative yeah. space over here in our little, our little bubble over here, <clears throat> Yeah, <clears throat> which so, I think is great because it does act as a bridge to mm. kind of both paradigms of medicine. Yeah. So w it, what would you say to someone who asks you the question, 
of why is preconception health important? If someone is not really understanding why that is, what, what is the best response for that? So I can give you just like a bullet pointed list. Yeah. <laughs> um, and the, and one of them I already mentioned is that everybody benefits from optimizing yeah. their health um, in a way because evolutionarily, biologically, we are healthiest when we are at our most, most fertile, right? That is what we are designed to do. So if we can support fertility, then we are maximizing all areas of our health. And because, you know, in our kind of precision medicine model, in our biohacking sphere, some of the things that we do to enhance vitality actually have a negative impact on longevity and vice versa. So using preconception fertility as a lens, we're really making sure that we're maximizing both of those areas and not detracting from one or the other. But the answer that you're really looking for, um, the biggest thing I think is that 50% of pregnancies in the U S and globally are unplanned. So, Mm -hmm. and that's with all of the medical care that we have these days and access to contraception and what have you, 50% Mm -hmm. of pregnancies are surprises. So having our, our health at the forefront helps those pregnancies proceed in a healthy way and have, you know, successful outcomes. If that is the way that that pregnancy goes. Um, I would also say that, um, there are so many things that we can do to, to add to our diets, supplementation, um, to support our fertility, our pregnancy experience, our birth experience and the postpartum period. And when I say I don't typically call myself a fertility person. I'm a preconception mm-hmm. person because I think that it encompasses more. It's not just health leading up to conception. It's pregnancy. It's pregnancy symptoms. It's reduction of pregnancy complications. It's reduction mm-hmm. of labor complications. It's, you know, being um, in the healthiest state that you can be in going into the pers- postpartum period because it is so challenging for most women Um, and then most importantly is that we are setting positive foundations for the health of our child for the rest of their lives. Um, from a, you know, physiological, from an epi, epigenetically modifiable sphere, and also just from role modeling in the house. So we are setting positive behaviors for ourselves that directly impact and indirectly impact our kids and what better gift can you give them? I can't think yeah. of a whole lot. Um, and, and a lot of this is really easy and really, it's really simple. It's not necessarily easy. And yeah. you have health coaching. Conceptually pocket, simple. So. Yeah. 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 So, so yeah. those are a lot in fertility too, for both men and women. There are mm-hmm. a lot of things that we can remove, um, alcohol, yeah smoking, cannabis. I know people don't like to hear that, but they are very negatively impactful um, on sperm quality and count and success of conception. Mm -hmm. So if we can remove those for the 90 days prior to trying to conceive, then we can make a, a huge impact on rates of conception success and just how the pregnancy plays out in general. Um, yeah, and all sorts of amazing things with just doing some, some simple habit changes. Yeah. And I think the importance of it is also underscored by how many kids are now, you know, the, the, the amount of childhood diseases, childhood illnesses, and the, the links that we're finding to maternal health and everything like right. that. So I think that that is just, you know, the more reason to understand why preconception health is so important. If we can, you know, it, uh, affect the physical and mental health of our kids better um, by a healthier pregnancy, a healthier pre-pregnancy for the mother and in the father, which we'll talk about um, yeah. as well. Um, you know, th- that's so important. So, so definitely appreciate you, um, yeah, talking about that. Now, yeah, um, this word epigenetics gets thrown al- around a lot now, and it does. Um, you know, it's it's bit of a buzzword, I guess. And 100%. <laughs> you know, pe- people understand, people understand genetics for sure. 
Um, but what exactly is epigenetics and how should the average layperson conceptualize that? So we got to start with genetics, obviously. So genetics is your, your blueprint. It's the actual um, hardwired information that every cell in your body contains. <laughs> but the cell in my nose behaves very differently from the cell in my heart yet they have the same genetic code. So what is influencing that? How are different cells within my same body have drastically different appearance and function? And that is right. basically epigenetics. It's how our genetics is actually read and interpreted and then manifested in our body. So genetics, epigenetics is the interaction of our genetics with our environment. It's how um, my mood even, but the food that I eat, the supplements that I take, the environment, the physical environment that I am exposed to, how that is turning on or off genes in my body to make proteins to then manifest mm -hmm. in, in whatever way it's going to manifest. Is that yeah. kind of... <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And I think it's, you know, that's what I try to also explain to people when we're talking about autoimmune conditions or other mm. conditions where, you know, uh, we always, we talk about your, um, you know, gen genetics, um, what's the, um, the analogy used uh, genetics, uh, environment pulls the trigger, right? Uh, genetics yes. loads the gun, environment pulls the trigger. So you know, yep. those kinds of uh, conceptual understandings where if you have Hashimoto's or if you have an autoimmune condition, then it is a genetic predisposition along with an environmental stressor, environmental factor. And that together comprises, you know, how your environment interacts with your genetics. And so exactly. that's how I try to tell my patients that, that um, ask me about that. And, and that's exactly, you know, that is why I was in such good health when I became pregnant with my son was because mm -hmm. I was using my epigen, my genetic information to make changes to my lifestyle and influence my epigenetic expression. And yeah. that is how I achieved lupus remission for the first time. Um, and then was able to do it again after the postpartum yeah. period where everything kind of goes crazy. Um, yeah. and so, being able to achieve remission from lupus twice. And that is another reason why I'm so passionate about this and why yeah. I think it's an important information for people to have. Yeah, it's such a difficult illness to deal with. And so, um, you know, it's not easy to put it into remission. So good for you. Thanks. I'm, yeah, um, I'm pretty proud of myself. I won't lie. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> um, so, you know, someone who comes to you with just like my patient came to you where they want to optimize their health preconception. What are the top recommendations that you would give to the couple? Um, we can talk about the, the, the woman first, and then we can also go on to the male or male mm -hmm. counterpart and how that's, that's very important as well. Cause I'm sure people are curious to know that why is, is it right. important for the health of the male in the health of the child. So, right. Yeah, yeah. Tell us about that. Because it's not just one, mm -hmm. it takes two, two to tango. So, mm -hmm. so the basic information that I would give the, the couple of book people is the foundational health that we talk about in every aspect of life. It's optimizing sleep, making sure you're getting mm -hmm. roughly eight hours of quality sleep every night. Um, mm -hmm. Altered sleep, you know, promotes inflammation. It promotes insulin resistance, which promotes further inflammation and inflammation reduces your capacity to successfully carry a pregnancy, um, mm -hmm. or conceive in the first place. So sleep is huge. Nutrition. Are you in a calorie surplus? Are you in a calorie deficit? Are you getting enough mm -hmm. calories to maintain your hormones? Are you, do you have nutritional deficiencies? Mm -hmm. Um, are you perhaps on a, um, a restricted type of diet that isn't allowing you to get optimal nutrition. And for a great example for preconception is um, a lot of people have genetic variations. So SNPs, single, nu single nucleotide polymorphisms, where, you know, maybe they don't convert 
inactive vitamin A to active vitamin A as well. And so people like that really should be eating animal products. And that is really mm -hmm. challenging when talking with someone who's vegetarian or vegan. So mm -hmm. trying to work around issues like that. How do you get optimal nutrition when your genetics just don't support that conversion? Examples mm -hmm. like that. Um, movement, movement is huge. Um, not only for, for mental health, but insulin resistance reduction, blood sugar regulation in general, um, you know, building cardiovascular health is, is important for pregnancy and delivery, obviously. Um, and you know, kind of those, those pillars of health that we <clears throat> really, um, just kind of hammer into people in their heart. Yeah. Like conceptually, they're very simple, but putting them into action sometimes takes a lot of yeah. help. Yeah. And that's why we have yeah. coach health coaches. Um, so going away from kind of our, our basic health things, there are, um, other behaviors for both men and women. Like I already said, um, abstaining from alcohol, abstaining from smoking, abstaining from cannabis. Um, cause we know that those, you know, smoking, um, produces, uh, all sorts of things that uh, inhibit proper sperm production, um, or quality of the egg. So if you are thinking about conceiving in, in three months, that's, that's a great window. That's how long it takes for a sperm to be made and travel to where it needs to go. Yep. So that 90 days is crucial not to add things that shouldn't be there that are going to detract from the health of the sperm and the egg. Um, also being aware of, you know, environmental toxicants, um, heat. I know that we've, we've always like joked about, um, laptops on the lap and cell phones in the mm -hmm. pocket and yeah. their negative impact on sperm quality. But yeah. I think that the, the data is actually, um, proving that that is correct. Um, yeah. so being, being mindful about things like that, no hot tubs, no saunas, um, mm -hmm. and things that we, we don't really think about, um, in our day to day, especially things, um, like sauna, which it has a lot of health benefits. Um, and a lot of people are doing, um, but in this space and in, in those 90 days, not the best idea. Mm -hmm. Um, so looking at our habits, even those that we do think are healthy, um, and, and maybe rethinking some of those, um, mm -hmm. there's also some supplementation that has been shown to support, um, egg quality and sperm quality, mostly surrounding supporting mitochondria. Um, mitochondria are, you know, super important for a lot of aspects of reproductive health, especially during, um, spermatogenesis production mm -hmm. of the actual sperm. And then also, um, at conception in, in that whole intricate process, if we don't have enough mitochondria, some of those processes don't function in the way that they need to. And that's part of the mechanism for when we get things like trisomy and we get, um, mm -hmm. extra genetic material or we get like Down enough syndrome. genetic material, yeah. right. Um, and mm -hmm. miscarriage and, and all of those things. Yeah. So if we can support our mitochondria through, mm -hmm. you know, L-carnitine, CoQ10, um, things like that, then we can really do a lot to support um, mm -hmm. in both men and women to yeah. health, which yeah, is pretty no. cool. Yeah. We can actually yeah, dial it in a lot more than, um, we, we think we, we, think can. we, we have can. a lot more control. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now men specifically, we were, we were alluded to that. Um, why is it important for the man trying to, con or the man uh, along with his partner trying to conceive, um, in his health? Um, is as far as the health of, of the child goes? Um, so a bunch of things. So there's the fertility aspect. There's the actual production yeah. of the sperm and the sperm mm -hmm. quality, um, yeah. which has a, a huge impact on pregnancy itself and the health of the child going forward. Um, also, you, we're starting to get data on um, 
the body composition of the father and its impacts on the metabolic health of the child. So we think that dad just kind of donates DNA, just like this information, but it, we're, mm -hmm. we're finally understanding that there is so much more to it. From an epigenetic standpoint, we know that the age of the father um, can impact mm -hmm. things like um, uh, mood disorders, prevalence of mood disorders in the child. Right. So fathers above the age of 40 um, correlationally have children with higher rates of schizophrenia. Um, mm -hmm. So interesting information like that. And in, in, in thinking about rethinking how we do male reproductive health. And maybe, yeah. maybe that looks like actually going in every five years and um, doing a semen quality analysis. Maybe it means freezing sperm mm -hmm. so that you can use your most optimal data to create that child. There are so many yes. things that we can do now. Um, and it's complex yeah. and it's a little taboo and, and not everybody's comfortable talking about it. Um, but I think that there are yeah. definitely interesting conversations to be had. So the reason w why we might be like our fathers is because of, you know, learned habits, but also a genetic component, which is very interesting because right. a lot of people, they get to a certain age and then they start behaving in patterns that are similar to their <laughs> fathers or mother, but uh, father um, in this case. And so, you know, it's, it's fascinating that there's a, a genetic link there as well. Well, and it's interesting too, because gametes, so the egg and the sperm, um, they're not really modifiable in the way that mm. our, the rest of our cells are. And so this yeah. idea of epigenetics and what we're learning from it is just kind of throwing everything on its head, right? So yeah. it, it, we didn't think that it was possible for your behaviors, your environmental exposures to impact your children, but we're finding that it actually is. It is, yeah. Now, are you That's running any specific cool. uh, genetic tests or any specific tests other than basic lab work and whatever we talked about? Um, so, on yeah, I use um, patients? I use the Apirons epigenetic test or their genetic test kits, and they have mm -hmm. um, they have really cool reports. And the difference between Apiron, um, A P E I R O N, that one's mm -hmm. tricky for people. Um, the difference between their test and things like 23andMe or Ancestry mm -hmm. um, is that, and this may have changed, I haven't really kept up with 23andMe and Ancestry, but it used to be that they just gave you your genes and maybe right. it was like flagged as red or green or yellow or something, but they gave you your genes in isolation and they gave you information that wasn't modifiable for the most part. Mm -hmm. What Apiron does is they have algorithms built around a specific health topic, say insulin resistance. So they're looking at all of the genes that heavily impact that health topic and, and um, kind of calculating a risk, your propensity mm -hmm. for that to manifest in your reality. So I think that it's much more detailed. It's much more nuanced. It's giving you much more actionable information. It's telling yeah. you, okay, this is your risk and this is what you can do to mitigate it. These are mm -hmm. the things that epigenetically influence these genes in a positive way. And I don't think we're seeing that. We're starting to see it a little more, but I think that Apiron has done a really good job of, of creating these reports and making them yeah. really user-friendly and making them just highly highly impactful yeah that's that's great information yeah yeah so um if people have to get in touch with you um what is a good way that they can find you so i'm kind of all over the place right now but you can find me at hand like hand wellness.com i'm also um on facebook and instagram under the same handle um and if you go to handwellness.com slash fun stuff, F U N S T U F F. Um, there will be information about the, uh, the upcoming book that I'm being published in, um, yeah. in the next couple of weeks, it's called epigenetic expressions. Um, and it's a bunch of women 
um, epigenetic coaches and consultants and kind of our stories of how we personally or with clients have used epigenetics to improve people's lives. And it's um, a bunch of powerful women. It's a great collaborative. And I think it'll be really interesting um, for your, your crowd of people. Um, you will also find there, I'm going to run a chocolate challenge in February because Valentine's Day, you know, all that oh. fun stuff. So we're going to be looking at kind of the history of chocolate, some of the health impacts, both positive and negative, Mm -hmm. um, as well as some recipes, how to utilize it in your life for positive health impact. Um, And then it's going to culminate hopefully in a um, cacao ceremony here in Austin, if you're local. Um, So check that out. It'll be really, really fun. Um, We've always got fun stuff going on over at Hand Wellness and on my social. Love to see you there. awesome. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, thank you so much for this conversation. It was, you know, very enlightening uh, talking about epigenetics and the importance of preconception health. I certainly learned a lot and, you know, I look forward to helping these patients more in their journey because we need to ensure that the next generations are right. healthier and healthier. But unfortunately, the the path we're going down is that they're less and less healthy. But I yeah. think that we're trying to change that. So, you know, folks like yourself are um, doing really hard work in that space. So I appreciate it. Thank you again. And um, yeah, look forward to continued collaboration. Thanks so much. I appreciate being here.